Hey, good morning, North Park family. Happy Sunday. So glad you're joining us today. I want to remind you that you can go on the YouVersion Bible app. There you can search under live events and find North Park Church. There you'll find notes um, and helpful quotes from today's message. And as always, um, you can always join us live uh, in person at Riverbend Middle School at 10 a.m. So we're going to continue our series on the biography of a Savior. Uh, this week we're in week three. Uh, week number one, we looked at the incredible impact that the life of Jesus had on education and how the Christian church was the first to educate women and children and slaves and all people as a part of this command to go out and make disciples. And a part of making disciples was teaching people how to read and write. And so how that had just this incredible influence and how a huge majority, over 90% of all colleges founded in the United States were to train pastors and Christian leaders. Sunday school was not a church thing, it was a thing for all children because so many of them worked six days a week, 12 hour shifts. Sunday school was created to spread the gospel, but also teach children how to read. And then in week number two, Pastor Anthony did an incredible job talking about humility and how in Roman culture there were these different levels of class and really only 2% of the population was viewed to have any real value and how Jesus steps on the scene and in his leadership and in the washing of the disciples feet he talks about two different types of pride uh, there's the pride that's really unwilling to help serve but then there's another type of pride that's unwilling to allow someone to serve you and so this week we're going to take a look on at, at how Jesus life and teaching affected women, uh, how they were viewed in the first century, and then uh, many of the rights and privileges that women enjoy today really kind of came about because of the teaching and influence of Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you to get your Bible or iPad and turn with us to Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38, very familiar story. And we will get started with week number three of Biography of a Savior. What's up, North Park? We're so glad you guys are joining us online. I just want to invite you all to worship our God. Come on. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my
Our text today is Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Um, it comes right after the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in that story, Jesus shares a parable that would have really angered the Jewish people because in that story, the hero of the story is not a Jewish person, but a Samaritan. Um, and when you look through the scriptures, you know that the Samaritans and Jews did not get along, were, were pretty awful to one another. And Jesus shows the Samaritan actually being the one to show the love of God and loving his neighbor as himself. And so right away by telling that parable, Jesus is letting us know that the kingdom of God uh, is not just for Jewish people. Uh, and today we're going to see that the kingdom of God has a special place, not just for men, but also women. And in the first century, that would have been a pretty shocking idea. Jesus is going to do something in, in what seems to be a pretty simple story that speaks volumes about uh, the role and responsibility and, and, and the value that women have in the kingdom of God. And so a part of this series, Biography of a Savior, each week we've tried to highlight how historically something Jesus had either uh, was teaching or something that Jesus has done has made a huge impact, not just in the first century, but also today. And many of the things that we look at and go, well, well yeah, life's that way really are not ideas that in the first century people would have looked at as very common. In fact, they would have been looked at as ridiculous. And one of those things is uh, the place of women in society and in culture. And so we're going to see in this passage in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, Jesus is coming right after, uh, Luke places this story rather right after the Good Samaritan. And we pick up in verse 38. It says, now as they went on their way, most likely Jesus and his disciples are traveling and uh, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Jesus stopped in Bethany to see his friends, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary before heading to Jerusalem. Um, Bethany was about two miles from Jerusalem. So it would have been an easy place for Jesus to stop and either have a meal or actually stay and then be able to go back and forth very easily into the huge city of Jerusalem that would have been packed with people, especially during religious festivals. And so this was a great place for Jesus to kind of get away, uh, also enjoy the company of uh, a family that he loved very much, Mary, Martha, sisters, and their brother, Lazarus. Now we don't know from the story, some commentators say that, that Jesus brought the entire uh, group of disciples with him and just kind of shows up. But the, the original text does hint that Jesus stops by unannounced. So I just want you to think about this for a moment. Just deciding what to have for dinner um, can cause a lot of division in households. Uh, just the more kids we have, the more opinions there are. Sometimes we just shut it down uh, and we say, all right, nobody gets an opinion. We're just going to pick. Uh, but, but just making the decision of what to eat. Now, just imagine when you have people over, right? You, you scrub the house, you set out your Bible and open it up and people are like, oh, this is, you know, and you got, you got worship music playing. You want to just kind of make everything look amazing. And you, you push everything you have that's kind of messy into one room and just pray they never open that door and you have people over, right? But you like to what, have time to prepare. And in this story, it appears that Jesus just shows up and not only does he just show up, but, but he might most likely brought some people with him. And we're going to see two major characters in this story. We're going to see Mary and we're going to see Martha. And their response to Jesus and him being present, these two responses are very different. And we're going to see two things. We're going to see 
the role and just the, the high regard that Jesus has for women in the first century uh, when that was not a very common thing. But also we're going to learn from Martha and see that Martha was actually doing everything that was expected of her in her culture. Actually, Martha wasn't really doing anything wrong or evil or bad, but it may have not been the wisest choice what she chose to spend her time and energy on. And so yeah, verse 39 tells us this, um, and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Now, if we're just reading that in our context, we'd say, well, of course, Mary knows who Jesus is. Jesus says lots of great stuff. She's over at his house. Maybe they're kind of in a, in a living room setting and she's just kind of catching up. Well, in, in this culture and what's said here, even that statement to sit at the Lord's feet meant to sit under someone's authority. In fact, in the culture in which this happened and takes place, uh, houses were actually divided kind of for a male space and a female space. Now, normally when it was just, you know, Mary, Martha, and potentially their brother Lazarus living together uh, as family, kind of the house was open to everyone. But when guests would come, uh, tradition and culture, just not just Jewish culture, but Roman culture would play a big part. And what would happen is there would be certain spaces uh, where only men would be allowed to be, and there would be spaces where women would, would kind of stay in those quarters. And so um, the, the public room is where the men would gather. And so different men who are not family, if they would come together to eat or to discuss or to just kind of relax together, uh, the women would stay in the other quarters, which would be the kitchen or anything that would be out, not seen by outsiders, right? So women were to not be seen. The men would be in the common area. The women may prepare the meal, uh, but they would not sit down and eat with the men. And this was very common in Roman culture in the first century and also Jewish culture. Now to say that Mary was at his feet was the official position of a disciple because Jesus was a traveling rabbi. He was a teacher uh, and teachers would, would sit and that was the position of, of teacher. But then the, the rabbis would sit at his feet to listen. Um, it was to be their student. And, and many times you would do this if you wanted to be a teacher yourself, meaning you were sitting down to hear this teaching with the desire that you could in turn share what's been shared with you to others. Again, we would look at this and say, well, that sounds like a great idea. But only serious disciples that were preparing to be teachers would do this. And at this time, this role was not permitted for women. Now, there's some layers here. There's, there's the Roman culture, which we'll look at. And there was the Jewish culture. And both of those cultures combined during this time had a huge influence. So first, let's look at the Roman and Greek culture. Uh, women were to stay in certain rooms. Uh, women were not allowed to just kind of travel outside the home uh, on their own unless they had a male family escort with them. Uh, they did not trust women to walk alone. It wasn't really a safety thing to protect them. Uh, it was just more of a cultural thing. They didn't want uh, only really prostitutes or, or a mistress would travel by herself. And we'll get to that in just a second. But just an example of how women were treated in this culture in first century, um, we have an actual letter um, from a Roman man who was out of town and his wife was very close to giving birth. And he says, I ask and beg of you to take good care of our baby son. Now, Obviously, then they didn't know uh, what the gender of the baby was going to be. He says, if you, are, if you are delivered of the child before I come home, if it's a boy, keep it. If it's a girl, discard of her, discard of it. He says, discard. Now, this letter would not be shocking. In fact, if you were to read the entirety of the letter, he says all these beautiful things about his wife and how much he loves her and excited about their future together. And then just in a very cold kind of common statement just says, oh yeah, like, you know, like you do. If it's a boy, keep it. If it's a girl, discard it. And many times what they would do is either kill the child or set the child out to starve to death or put, put the child in a place um, to where it was just kind of exposed to the ailments. And in Roman law, there was actually a law for this. A Roman father was supposed to keep uh, their, their male children, but only had to keep one female. So if you had another daughter, it was just expected that you would either kill her or, or just kind of release her out in the wild for some animal to kill her. Okay. And in ancient Sparta, which is in you know, the Greek culture, um, 
women who had, who, who had uh, boys were given double the food and resources. Uh, and if you had a daughter, they would actually kind of try to starve you out and maybe not give you as much food. And because of that, in Roman culture especially, men greatly outnumbered women. Um, and, and so even in the Jewish culture, this was a part, right? One Jewish rabbi said it was shameful to hear a woman's voice in public among men. So, so women just shouldn't even speak outside. Uh, another Jewish rabbi said, let the words of the law be burned rather than committed to a woman. What, what he was saying, now this doesn't reflect all Jewish people, but what this particular rabbi was saying was, it would be better to burn the scriptures than to actually waste the time teaching a woman the scriptures now imagine all of this in culture. Don't educate women. Don't speak to women. Women need to stay in certain areas of the home. And again, the Jewish people were very much on the cutting edge of things, had a high value of women in marriage. But even just culturally, women were not expected to be at the feet of a rabbi, to be learning from a rabbi. And Jesus, not only does he not rebuke this woman, but he actually encourages her to learn from the rabbi. And think about what Christianity has done. All three synoptic gospels note that women followed Jesus. Now that term just followed Jesus. They would, they would go with Jesus. They would follow him, hear his teachings, be a part. Many people believe a lot of his ministry was funded by women. And this behavior is not really unusual to us today, but in the first century culture, again, the only women who would go out that were not uh, accompanied by a male family member were prostitutes. So just to take women along with him as he teaches and goes and to elevate them to students would have been very counterculture to not only the Roman, but also to the Jewish people. Think about this. In the Gospels, it was the women who followed Jesus to the cross, even when, many of the, when the men were afraid and deserted. In the, all four Gospels, the task of being witnesses who would proclaim the resurrection is given to women. In fact, that's one of the ways that we know the, the Bible is a historical uh, narrative, uh, something that actually happened, because if you're going to make up a story in that time, you would never use women as eyewitnesses because many times their witness didn't count in court. So unless that really happened, you would not make up a story in which women were the eyewitnesses. But, but in, in this new kingdom that Jesus was building Women were the first to share that news. Women stayed with him to the end. In, uh, in Paul's letters, women are not simply just worshipers of the, in the early church. They were also leaders. Think about this. Paul mentions uh, some women by name as leaders in the church houses. Some of the uh, houses, house churches were actually hosted at the homes that were owned by women. Um, later, we see that Paul uh, refers to Priscilla as one of his fellow workers. This would have been absolutely just mind-blowing to the people of Paul's day. In fact, historian Rodney Stark estimates that the early Christian community would have been made up of about 60% female. So we can already see Jesus' value of women in this story and his willingness and desire to teach Mary. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. So Martha's offended that Mary has stepped out of the cultural norm and gone to the place where only men would be to learn like only a male student would learn. But then she's also aggravated that her sister, you know, kind of being lazy, not helping her the way that she thinks she should. And she's also frustrated at Jesus and says, do you not care? Like, do you not see what's going on here? And there's this word here where it says Martha was distracted. That word distracted means to be dragged away. So there was somewhere where Martha was supposed to be. But all of these things she was trying to accomplish actually dragged her away from it. Verse 41, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. And anytime you repeat somebody's name, it's not because you're angry. It was actually a show of compassion. You are anxious and troubled about many things. That word anxious means to be torn into pieces in many different directions. The word troubled there is, describes a ship that is tossed along um, and is pushed along the stream instead of being able to power itself. So it's a ship that's not going in the direction it needs to. It's just kind of left to go wherever, and it has no control. 
torn apart into pieces, dragged away, out of control is where Martha finds herself. And she's mad. She's upset at Jesus. She's upset at her sister. Verse 42, but one thing is necessary, Jesus says. Mary has chosen the good portion. So Jesus, in a culture that says women have no place being in this space, learning like this, Jesus says she has, Mary has made the right choice. She's picked the one thing that matters most, and that cannot be taken away from her. Despite what culture says, despite what people think, that cannot be taken away. He says one thing is necessary. Now, we've kind of looked at Mary and what that, that would do for women in the first century and how that kind of carried along through the church. When we look at Martha, that, that may be the place where you find yourself. And it's important to say, Martha had not sinned here. Martha had not done anything morally wrong. Martha just simply didn't make the wisest choice. She was flustered, and, and, and here's three things. The first one is, there's just this inner turmoil inside of her. Think about this. Uh, Mary had chosen one thing. Martha had chosen 30 things. For Mary, her one focus at that moment was to be at the feet, under the authority of Christ in that moment. And Mary, her mind was on 30 different things. Even just preparing a meal, the different things that you have to time just perfect. But I think this story is talking about something bigger. There are so many things and areas that we are dragged away to that we are trying to be perfect at and do well. And all of them have to go perfect in order for us to be happy. Probably one of the most difficult things we do as parents with young kids in our home is we try to take family photos. And I don't mean like when you hire a professional, that's one thing. I mean when you try to do it yourself, okay? And several thousand things go wrong when we take a picture. Before any picture is posted on social media, if we're outside, number one, if the sun is out at all, all three of my boys, their eyes just begin to water and and they can barely keep their eyes open. So to get a picture where it doesn't look like they've just been sobbing is nearly impossible. The other thing is to get everybody looking in the right direction and actually smiling is pretty difficult. And after a lot of intense coaching from mom and dad, we're all pretty miserable in that moment, right? We're we're just, just even just taking a picture. There's this kind of this, we're trying to accomplish this one goal and there's so many different things at play so many things to make that moment perfect. And maybe we relate to that on a larger scale in our life. There are so many things that you're trying to set up. You want this to be right and this relationship and this person and this thing. And if my job would just do, if this would happen, then I would be happy is a statement I make. And I'm sure you make a lot. And Jesus says for Mary, she had one thing. I just want to be at Jesus's feet right now. For Martha, it was 30 and it created this inner turmoil. Why? Because in life, All 30 of those things never work out at the same time. There are good things that happen, but for everything to be just right, for you to have peace, Jesus says, is not going to happen. The second thing is she's irritable, and I like what Keller says, with incompetent people. Do you kind of find yourself right now frustrated at other people and say, you know what, I would be happy. I would have peace if this person would just. So the first one is, if these things would happen, The second one's a little bit more specific. There's a list of people in your life or maybe people that are just driving in traffic with you that are getting in the way of your peace and of your happiness and you're frustrated and you want to control them. And Jesus simply says, you can't. The third one is this. She's even suspicious of God at the moment. Now I want to say this is a natural part of the Christian faith. But she finds herself saying, Lord, don't you care? And at some point in your journey with Jesus, you will find yourself, I mean, heroes of the faith in Scripture say, God, where are you? What have you done? Why do you feel so distant? But sometimes we find ourselves in life, and we just came out of this series on the, the, you know, the, aloof, the, reloof, re, reloofless, the ruthless elimination of hurry. And, and, and Martha is trying to accomplish so many things and for what she believes is the right reason. And she's frustrated at people. And she says, Lord, do you really care? And here's what Martha says. Martha would say, but I'm doing this for God. So why am I so frustrated? And here's what the thing is. Jesus is saying, look, look, a simple meal right now would be fine. 
Because what really matters, the one thing is that you're with me in this moment. And you can say you're doing this for me, but I didn't ask you to do these 30 things. I didn't ask for you to make it this elaborate. I didn't ask for you to overcommit. I want you to be in this space and in this moment. And this brings up a great question. What do we do? Andy Stanley really has some great advice about these moments. What do we do about these moments where we have to make some decisions about life and it's not a right or wrong and it's not a legal or illegal or moral or immoral, but there's a lot of decisions that we make every single day that don't fit into those categories, but those decisions still have a great effect on us. Again, Martha was not committing a sin. Martha was not doing anything immoral, but Martha had a choice to be in there at the feet of Jesus or to be worrying and trying to plan something more elaborate, more perfect than she was ever asked to do. So the better question would be for Martha is what's the wise thing for me to do at this moment? And Andy Stanley in his book gives us three reference points when we're making a decision. And this Sunday um, at North Park, we are um, honoring our graduates. And a lot of times when you graduate, you just think of your life in these big moments. But really, if if you've graduated high school now and and kind of moved on in life, you know that really life is not a lot of these big epic moments, but it's just millions of these small little decisions. In fact, these big moments in life reveal who we are. They reveal our character. But who we are is formed in these little small mundane decisions, these little moments that it's not a right or a wrong or a moral or immoral, but it's really just what's the wise thing for me to do at this moment. And Andy Stanley points out that these three reference points help us because if we just stay in one and try to make a decision, we usually make the wrong or not the most wise decision. The first one is, he says, in light of my past experiences my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing for me to do? So he puts it together in this phrase, in light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, my future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing for me to do? For Martha, her past experience was, I need to be where Jesus is at. Because in my past experiences, wherever he is, that is the best place to be. Say Martha says, you know what? Being at the feet of Jesus is the best place to be. I know that from the past. But in my current circumstances, am I upset about something else? Is there something that needs to be addressed in my heart? Why am I really frustrated? Just make a decision based off right now. And don't make a decision just based off the future. But also consider the past. Think about where you are right now and where you want to be, and ask yourself, what is the wise thing to do? It's not the big events of life that forge our character. It's these small mundane moments of deciding to make a 10-course meal or a simple meal so she can spend time with her Lord. And those decisions we make, make us. So we have to eat, we have to sleep, we have to have appointments and phone calls and errands and all of these things, and you have to work it all in. And there's a tremendous amount of things that need your attention, kind of that hustle and grind of life. But it's your ability and my ability to set priorities and to focus our attention at the feet of Christ and to not let all those other things that happen every day pull us away, sweep us away from him. What's the wise thing to do? Based on my past experiences, my current circumstances, my future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing to do? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you bring us wisdom. I pray, Lord, in a culture and a time that is constantly pulling us, Lord, that we would find ourselves at your feet to learn from and to draw from you. Lord, I thank you for what you have done in the kingdom of God for and through women. I thank you, Lord, that all souls matter to you and that, Lord, you are building your church. We thank you ultimately, Lord, for your salvation, for your death, burial, and resurrection. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Church Online. As Pastor Anthony says, you made our day when you logged on. Have a great week.